Well, I'm not just going to uh, do a uh, just a cameo picture thing, although I'm going to show you a few slides so that some of you who don't know anything about this ministry will know what's going on. There's something more than that, although that that is important. I don't mean to minimize that, Lord. Uh, the Lord just asked me to kind of relate uh, a little bit of this ministry to you. But there's another reason that the Lord was laying this on my heart. I've had in particular um, some, some thoughts on my heart recently about the role of the Holy Spirit. And I want to read to you a text. If you'll turn in your scriptures, and I won't have anything up on the screen except for some uh, pictures of Wombat in a minute, but... Uh, Wombat, by the way, is Wheels Over Michigan Bike -a and There's always new folks with us here or there, newer, and so I want to make sure that we don't just leave you out with these uh, acronyms we use. But uh, I want to read from Acts chapter 10. So take your scriptures and turn there. There's a story about Cornelius and Peter. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a tremendous uh, story in the Bible. Um, and it, it kind of helps us begin our time together. So we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. I'm beginning in verse 17 of chapter 10. There's Bibles right in your seats in front of you if you need to pull those out and follow along. Beginning with verse 17 of Acts chapter 10. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Let me stop there for a minute and tell you that Cornelius, in the earlier part of this chapter, received another vision in his own home. But to understand who Cornelius was is important. Because Cornelius was a man, a centurion, that was over a hundred. That's what the word centurion means, or century, we would think of that word. Uh, but he was a Roman centurion, and so he was a Gentile, right? He was also uh, one step just below a tax collector. You remember the view of the tax collector in Jesus' day? That would be right down at the bottom of the pool. That would be like someone who works for the IRS, but they are instructed, and they are the cheater of all cheats. They skim off. They always charge you more for taxes. Uh, probably almost always. I'm sure there's an honest one in the bunch, but they were uh, way down there on the total pool. Roman centurions were considered one step below that. This centurion was sent by the Lord Oh, actually, the centurion was to send his regiment, to send his men to Peter. So Peter's in his house, and he's having this vision. And, and we're about to see the Jews and the Gentiles come together, aren't we? We're, we're, we're beginning to see the age of the Gentile world, which is like almost all of us here. I say almost all of us because... There is uh, always Jewish blood here or there among us. And so I respect that. But as Gentiles, as a largely Gentile congregation, we are being invited to be engrafted. That's another image that Jesus gives. Engrafted into God's holy family. So here was Peter getting this vision about these four-footed animals, which Jews do not eat. They are the forbidden food. And God says, rise and eat. Three times to Peter. And so Peter's receiving this vision. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, there's some men downstairs you're supposed to meet. And, and, and Peter knows that it's a Roman centurion. So we continue with the text. I believe uh, I'm on verse 19. That's where I'm going to start. While Peter was still thinking about the vision... The Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Now, isn't that a moment where Peter would have, like I had this morning, oh, really? I'm not so sure this is of the Lord. Now, Peter would, not at that point, not have any reason to doubt the Lord. 
but he has reason to honor the scriptures that he was given as a faithful Jew of that day. And so he certainly would have reason to question this, but the Lord repeated it three times, and so now he's to go and meet with these men. Verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men, don't miss this, Peter invited the Roman citizens, the non-Jews, into his home to be his guest. The amount of traversing that is going on in this story is monumental to say the least. So much is happening in this scene. But what I want you to see this morning as we begin this message, and Lord be with us as we speak, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in your life? What was the role of this voice from heaven? Uh, Cornelius speaks of a voice. He says to Peter later on, an angel spoke to me. Peter certainly knows he's heard from the Lord in his time of rest, by the way. There's that word rest again. And he's resting in the <clears throat> midday hours, and he receives this vision and these instructions, and this begins to play out. Peter ends up going to Cornelius, if you know the story, and there's not only the Holy Spirit speaking to men on both sides, but there is the obedience of the Lord's family in the mix of it. You see, Cornelius wasn't just your average centurion. It says he was God-fearing. You see, uh, Gentiles in that day, many Gentiles in that day, were following the Jewish customs and the law. They loved the Lord. They wanted to be a part of, the, of Israel. They couldn't be because of the way God had ordered things in the Old Testament. But now it was time. Now it was time, and this was just the beginning of the Gentile world being ushered in to the church. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I also want to challenge you this morning. Are you ready to do something different than you had planned? Certainly, that was just a moment of fear I had this morning. Lord, what would I say? Uh, they're not terrible notes, just so you know. <laughs> And, and of course, I trust the Lord for this message this morning. God is sometimes calling us to do something different than we had planned. Um, ten years ago, this Tuesday, it's a ten-year anniversary of Wombat, Wheels Over Michigan Bike Run. <coughs> ten years ago, two guys, not two nuns, but two guys <laughs> were... We're thinking about not growing old. Steve and I were pastoring together. He was a layperson there in, in Westland where I was at at the time. I was pastor, of course, and, and he and I had been talking. We both were coming up on our 50th birthday. Some of you know I just turned 60 last week, so speak loudly so I can hear you. But <laughs> when I turned 50, um, Steve and I said, we're not going to get old. We're going to do, we got to do something. And so we began to ride bikes together, and that began our journey. We decided to go on a bike trip, and uh, we ended up uh, biking up to Mackinac Bridge that first year, and, and that we did this, and, and it's just been nonstop ever since. And if you get a little tired of hearing this, sorry, it's just something, something we do, and that's what the Lord asked me to bring you today. Um, I want to show you how it all began. Uh, the first time we went up to Mackinac Island, there was four of us. Steve is on the left, I'm on the right, and uh, Amy and Bongi are in the middle. Um, I, I love telling this story because Steve and I went on a bike ride with two very less than intelligent college students. Because if they had known better, they wouldn't have gone with us. We, we left Westland not Upper Michigan, but we left Westland proper, down by Detroit, 
And we biked all the way up to the bridge in five, maybe six days, I can't quite remember. Five days, Judy says. So, uh, it's been ten years. And, and so we embarked on this 350 mile journey. Now, you, some of you know we do 250 uh, now, 50 a day, and at least as a baseline uh, for our trip. And we took these kids and we made them ride 60, 70, and 80 miles a day. The first day we got no further than Hines Drive, which is just about five miles north of the church, after a couple of flat tires in the church parking lot. We didn't even get out of the church parking lot, we were fixing flats. We had older bikes and, uh, you know, we were just making our way. And, and as we made it, made it up to Hines Drive, five, minutes or five miles away, um, we had our first accident. And when one of our bikes ran into the other, and my back wheel was now bent. In fact, I had to dismember the brake system on the back. I used my brakes only on the front because my wheels were wobble. And so my nickname that first year was Weebles. <laughs> Weebles Wobble, you know? And so uh, I had to ride the last 50 miles on Sunday afternoon. We took off on a Sunday. And, and got in the cam with a wobbly wheel. Every five to ten miles, I had to get off and actually take my foot and push on the wheel and pull on it and just jerry-rig it kind of straight again as it wobbled down the road. The next day, we got that fixed and uh, continued on our way. That first year was something else. You know, why would we want to repeat that? But we had a riot. I remember asking Bongi halfway up, a uh, beautiful spirited man, young man of course, and I asked Bongi, I said, Bongi, why did you really go on this ride? Because he had all the strength we needed. All of us needed his strength. He didn't practice, he did not train. I think he rode 20 miles before he went on this trip, but he would just zoom right past us, and, and he had no discipline. He would be all over the road. We'd be yelling up ahead of him because traffic was coming. There's cars coming, and he would just be out there lollygagging. And, and he told me this. He said, Randy, he said, I'll tell you why I went on this trip. He says, I've had hundreds of theological questions. And to spend the week with you and ask all these questions, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so I'm hyperventilating, trying to ride, answering his theological questions. And we have a ride. But pastor doesn't enjoy that. That was the beginning of our trip. Go to slide two. This is year two. We decided it was so much fun, right, that we would do it again. Those two college students were, got smart and they never returned. <laughs> uh, Amy and Bongi. Amy Brown now has two kids, lives in Kentucky, wonderful Christian, and Bongi's on with his life. We connected with uh, a church in Coldwater, which is still with us. And uh, Bob and Justine Hosteller became uh, perfect partners in crime. And they're riding there with us. There were six of us that second year, as well as Deb Sarno and Sue, who passed away of cancer just a couple of years ago. Um, we missed her dearly. So this was our second year, and we, this time we rode across the state. We got so excited about Mackinac Bridge, we decided to start at a nuclear plant on the west coast, and end our trip over in Monroe at yet another nuclear plant. That was really exciting. And so we had a great time going across southern Michigan, and it kind of was the birth of Wombat. Now there's a reason I'm telling you all this. Year number three comes along, and we sprouted to, to 12. So we went from four to six to 12, and uh, that was at the top of a hill called the Wall. It's the steepest incline in the state of Michigan. Yep. And if you can climb that wall, it's like a 27% grade, mm -hmm. I think. And it's, it's a killer. And uh, we're standing there at the top celebrating that we made it to the top. Go to the next slide and I'll move through these. We went to like 21. I remember these numbers for some reason. We went to 21. There's Nathan Struble over on the right, on the right side. He was smart enough just to ride with us once. And, <laughs> and, uh, and there was about... Uh, 21, like I said, 21 there. Go to the next slide. And year five, well, it's not a very good picture, but uh, we got up to about 26 or so in that year. And then the next slide, uh, here we are at Mackinac Bridge with 30. And we've gotten as high as 35. There's several more years to show. One more is there? Oh, this is the, the ride that we came from uh, the west side of Michigan all the way to Port Huron. 
And so we, instead of riding to Mackinac Bridge, we rode to the Port Huron uh, Bridge as well. And so it wasn't quite as exciting as Mackinac, but it was fun. Everybody was pumped. I, in fact, I tried to talk them out about it. I'm going, you know, it's, it's not that big of a bridge, you know. And they're like, we want to go, we want to go. I says, okay, okay. So we did, and we did the trip across the state. God has allowed us these last 10 years to see people run to Jesus. We've seen people find healing. We have seen, of course, monies raised. Many of you have given this year towards the Wombat uh, a vision to help Haiti, the Iron Dental Clinic, and pastors, training pastors and teachers, training teachers, those are the three arms now of our mission for Wombat. You've given and thank you. Appreciate that. Well over my minimum, so I appreciate that. Um, we'll have numbers another time. We don't have those really now, but it's got to be probably close to five, six hundred dollars. So praise God for that. Our team has raised enormous amounts of money each year, anywhere from twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars at the peak of of Wombat each year now. I think we'll probably hit $150,000 this year, uh, years together in the last 10 years. We celebrate that. We thank the Lord for that. All that money that you've given just goes directly because uh, we pay for our trip and then we raise money besides. So that's, that's where I'm going this week and loving making a difference there. It truly is vacation for me. And Judy, of course, comes along too. She loves it uh, as well. Uh, in a car. In a car. Yeah. She's got the smart. She's got the smart. Are you ready to do something different than you planned? Don't miss what God asked Peter and Cornelius to do. Don't miss what the Holy Spirit is saying to you this morning. That's what I'm asking you to consider. I was, I got up Thursday morning. I've been writing early in the morning this week, uh, last couple weeks, because it's about the only time I can get a ride in. And, and I got on my bike and I decided that I would ride instead of going to pastor's prayer on Thursday morning. Again, God spoke to me <laughs> and said, go to prayer. <laughs> I was only three blocks from the house and I heard that. The Lord says, go to prayer. Go to prayer. And I kept talking myself out of going to prayer just to get this ride in. And sure enough, I rode over on my bike to the city chambers where the pastors gathered to pray. And I, I had to take my bike up the elevator with me because I don't want to leave that bike up in uh, harm's way. And so, uh, bike and all, I walk into the room and just park it on the side of the wall and city chambers there. And didn't get arrested. And so entered the prayer time. And of course, a lot of good friends there, a lot of pastor friends. And the reason I tell you that is during prayer, uh, after them, all the guys were, and gals were asking me what's going on, and of course they've appreciated what I've, I've been doing and what's going on too. And, and so, right in the middle of prayer time, we've prayed for at least half an hour or so. Phil Whetstone, comes over, and all of a sudden, his hand is right to my shoulders. And you would have thought he would have prayed for Wombat, but we'd prayed for that and asked for prayer. The Lord said to me on my right, go to prayer, let him pray for Wombat. You need to pray over this trip. And so we did. But then something different happened. Um, our pastors have been particularly, as you have, very sensitive to what has happened to our family over the last few months. And they don't get to see me as often as you do. And they frankly get a little worried about me. And they were praying for me. And so, as Phil was praying, he said, Randy, as I pray, the Lord's given me a word. And I want you to know that when you receive a word, it's the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, everything needs to be tested. But I'm just saying that God wants to speak to you 
And he'll use other people oftentimes to speak to you. Sometimes it's his own spirit just speaking to you when your heart is sensitive to him. I'm talking about listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because he's speaking to us right now in this place. As Pastor Phil laid his hands on me, he says, Randy, the Lord gave me a word for you. And I just have to pray it over you. He said, the word is Ephraim. He said, you are Ephraim. And I want to tell you what that word means. He said, that word means fruitfulness and suffering. And my heart was tight, of course. Fruitfulness and suffering. And the day doesn't go by that the Lord doesn't use uh, our suffering as a family and losing a daughter in some way. I can tell you that there are many stories in this room that many of you could be named Ephraim or Ephraim. Fruitfulness and suffering. I'm here to tell you this morning that God is able to use everything for His glory. Everything about you, every idiosyncrasy, every turn that you feel has been a left turn or a right turn or a wrong turn, God can use all of that for His glory if you'll allow Him to. And the Holy Spirit wants to speak a word over you this morning. I know that sounds Pentecostal, but that's the message that I feel the Lord's given me for you today. You know, to be honest with you, a trip like Wombat is, is just something that we do for fun. But we decided as Christians, if we're going to have fun, let's at least allow our fun to make a difference. You see where that goes? Whatever we're doing with our life, whatever direction you're going with your life right now, are you willing to allow God to use it for His glory? And is it the direction that God is actually calling you at this time? You see, I remember back uh, in January when we just crossed the new year and I knew I was going to come to the first pastor's meeting and I was going to receive my new word for the year. And uh, Jason Pittman had kind of a tradition the last three years now bringing to the pastor's meeting these little slips of paper with a star on it. It's in my wallet, mine, and I keep it all year long. And last year's word that the Lord gave me on the day of Epiphany, uh, Epiphany in January was uh, patience. Ooh, we all want that word, don't we? And it was a year of patience. The Lord was going to teach me patience last year. So I was really intrigued to get to the new word. <laughs> came to January and went to the pastor's meeting. Not only was Jason not there, the words weren't there. Now, Jason and I are a prayer partner. Some of you know that. And so the next time we met, I said, Jason, where's my word? And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, you know those words you give on the day of Epiphany, the, the pastors made me go, oh, I wasn't going to do that for them this year. I said, did you do it for your church? He says, yes, I did. I said, I said very regally, what about me? <laughs> and so he said, I'll be right back. We were in his church at the time, and he went and he got the stack of sheets of, of that hadn't been used yet. And he says, here, let me mix them up. I says, okay. And he says, uh, pick one. I says, I only want the one off the top. Whatever the one off the top is the word for me for this year. And so he gave it to me. And that word, two weeks before my daughter's passing, was the word voice. The Lord was going to give me a new voice. Now I'm just trying to illustrate for you this morning how God wants to speak to you if you're willing to listen. I had no idea what that word meant either. I can see the look on your face. You don't know, quite, okay, Pastor, whatever that means. Well, I didn't know what it meant. But as uh, we went through some very tough days, I realized that the Lord is going to use me in my life, me and my family in ways that we hadn't quite expected, right? My question for you this morning is are you ready to let God use your life and give you your voice, your name, your whatever, 
that He wants to give you. You see, the Holy Spirit is speaking. But there's so many within the church today that can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's because they're not asking. And there's reasons that we don't ask. Number one reason is fear. We're afraid what God will ask. We're afraid that we'll wake up at 525 in the morning and the Lord's going to say, put that sermon down and trust me to speak through your voice. See, this is this morning I hope you get something out of this message. I'm sorry if you don't. <laughs> but this is maybe as my training time where the Lord's just saying, Randy, trust me to speak through you at this time. And so I am. God wants to give you a word. God wants to grip your heart. When something, when you're reading scripture, and please be in your word, the word of God. When you read the word, don't stop reading until something just hits you like a ton of bricks. And let that be God's word for you, for the day, for the month, for the year. Let that settle in your heart in such a way that you even would make changes with it. You see, it, it comes down to this one verse in Acts 1. Would you turn in your scriptures one more time as I close? Acts 1.8. It's a scripture you know very well. It is the most important verse in the New Testament in my estimation. Verse 8, Acts 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The ends of the earth. Well, how far is your voice supposed to reach? I ask you. Are some of you to reach Jerusalem? Are some of you to reach Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth? Which one are you called to reach? What do you think the answer to that question is? All. Every one of you is to reach the ends of the earth. You see, it's pretty simple. When I was in Florida, uh, I was there at General Conference two weeks ago, and my brother-in-law, Jerry, who knows everybody on the planet, he speaks around the world as an evangelist, Jan and Jerry, and right now they're in Pennsylvania this week to go to New Jersey and all that stuff. And, and Jerry came to me and he says, Randy, do you, I know you're not a delegate. I had no voting seat or anything. He said, would you take some time and take one of our guys from India uh, to the mall? Well, I wanted to answer, I don't have the gift of shopping, <laughs> to be honest. But I said, absolutely said, yes, I would love to. So I met Dexter about an hour later, and uh, Dexter and I went over and bought a pair of shoes. He wanted a pair of shoes for each of his kids. And uh, he wanted a particular kind of shoe that took us to every store in this outlet mall in the middle of Orlando. It was like stores that never end. It was a forever place. It was like the sh Disney of shopping, you know. And, and so there we were. And I had been there just the day before to buy a pair of shorts because I forgot my shorts, right, Tim? And, and, uh, and so I, I took him in there and we were shopping. And Dexter and I connected. Now I want to go to India. Because I've got a good friend in India. You see, I didn't have to go to India to minister to the ends of the earth. All I said was to my brother-in-law, sure, I'd be glad to help. And so Dexter and I got to talk. And then later in the day, Dexter came to me. His dad is the bishop of the Free Methodist Church in India. And, and I was just like, that's so cool. I knew about Bishop Galapali, uh, or maybe a grandson, I can't remember it. And, uh, and I was just like, wonderful. And I got to know the Indian church in a whole new way through Dexter. 
He had excellent English, and so we just had a ride of a time. All I'm illustrating for you this morning is each one of you have been given this authority. Are you with me today? Are you ready to receive the voice of the Holy Spirit? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit? God will speak. Let Him speak. Let Him wake you up in the middle of the night. Let Him, let him provoke you. And let your circumstances speak to you. God is doing something more powerful than you could ever, ever imagine. Would you pray? Let's have our worship team come. Prepare for the song. Now as we pray, and as we meditate, I just want you to think about that question. Are you in the right position to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and His voice for your life? You see, the Holy Spirit is speaking all around us, all around us, all the time. And He'll give you specific words at different times. Lord, I just pray for each person here this morning. I pray that you would help every one of us before the day is out. Maybe right now, you are speaking something pretty bold upon the hearts of your children. Lord, there's not a person in this room that you don't think can't hit a home run for the kingdom of God. Every one of us are home run hitters. Every one of us have a special design on our life. It doesn't matter our health. It doesn't matter our position. It doesn't matter our location. What matters is that we're available to your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. We're desperate. Someone didn't listen to the Holy Spirit this morning and they ended up taking some lives south of us. And we want to be people that hear the voice of the Holy Spirit so none of that happens around us and certainly would never happen to us. Lord God, speak to us today, we ask. Give us ears to hear. Lord, the, the printed message this morning was the tongue. <laughs> no wonder you didn't want it preached. You want us to listen, not speak. So speak to us, Lord. Even as we sing, even as we continue to pray, even as we receive communion today, we'll give you the glory. 